the show. Look at who has shown up. <laughs> <laughs> what's going on, man? What's what up? Is, what's going on? Listen, I, I want to see if you have a good memory. I don't know. We met back in the day. There was a function. Uh, I, think I probably, was, if it was a function, I probably met you there. Yeah, yeah. You, you know what? I, there's, only, there's no point to even talk about it, but I'll just say this. I remember you saying, man, I can see you doing this a long time. And you know what? It, you know, I took a lot of hits over the over over my career, and you know, we we like to remember things we want to. I hear you. I hear um, you. But believe it or not, man, I re just by you saying that because only takes like a little bit. Little it'll, bit. It takes a little bit. It takes a little it's bit. I do remember that, man. I'm I'm proud of you and what you're doing. I'm and, doing it. Uh, especially with that background, that background's pretty dope right there, man. It's pretty nice. I, pre I appreciate that, man. And um, beat, man. How be in the house, been? man. How be in the you house. Been? How you I'm been? good, man. I'm I'm safe. I hope you are. I hope your family's good. I hope everybody's out there doing what they're supposed to be doing to, to stop this curve, man. Just to get this, make it flatline. Hundred percent. Uh, we got to be doing our part, man, because uh, you know some people think they're invincible, and some people think they can just walk around like it's nothing. But this is a real deal, and I think after a month or so of this now, um, people, are, most people realize that this ain't no joke. This is no joke. No, and this is a pandemic, and this is affecting every facet of life right now, and we have to do our part as humans to uh, to alleviate this. So uh, there's no sports. I mean, I mean, there's nothing but highlights on now. You know, old games. I mean, they had a 1975 game on. Uh, it was like the Vikings versus uh, the Cowboys or somebody. So they're yeah. they are putting on old stuff. And it's it's a way of being with your family, and and again, hopefully everybody's safe, that you can strengthen those bonds with your family, and do the things that you're supposed to do, man. It's, it's I think it's a way of God God telling us to sit down and realize really what's important in life. I'm telling you, man, you made a good point because sometimes yeah. we are so go go go, and yeah. we don't take the moment to sit down and look. We don't have an opportunity to see, like we're so fast and going forward. We don't have time to call mom, call dad, call uncle. Now yeah. we're doing this maybe two or three times a week. Yeah, and it's and it's it's putting them bonds together that maybe you haven't had in a long time. Um, I know people are stuck in their house, but hey, there's nothing wrong with being home. I mean, oh, and, and I was talking to uh, actually I was on Facebook. Uh, I was on Face uh, IG Live with uh, a comedian. Um, Alex Thomas, who's a comedian, okay. and we talked about just how important it was as, for us as kids just to be outside. Like when we were kids, like, yo, man, let's go outside. That was like the best thing happening. Absolutely. And, and, and we take that for granted of being outside and what this earth has, and we have to preserve it. We have to do the right things, and this, uh, this what's going on really kind of, you know, puts it in perspective. I love that, man. And this is a great segue because growing up, um, I didn't grow up in the in the uh, uh, privileged uh, and, and privileged era. I mean, my, my mom and the pops had to work really hard, and the Boys and Girls Club was near and dear to me. Oh man, how did you get involved with the Boys and Girls Club? Because that was everything to me as a young kid I, I, growing up. That is a great point because that's really. I wouldn't be talking to you if it wasn't for a Boys and Girls Club. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Um, I started in the Boys and Girls Club when I was seven years old, and I was there every day. I'm telling you, I did not, because I lived in like a five-mile radius. You had the church that we used to go to and used to hear everybody hollering upstairs, and you would be downstairs. Yeah. And, they, you know, you'd be in Sunday school, and you'd be like, what am I doing here? And I didn't realize how important that was until I became an adult. And you had the church, and then across the street was the park where you played, and then around the corner was uh, – you know, your high school. I mean, I, it was a five-mile radius where I lived probably for 10, 15 years. I didn't go anywhere else. And that's where I developed all my relationships uh, as far as, you know, my friends in the neighborhood. You saw those friends every day, especially yes. in the summertime. And we all met at the Boys and Girls Clubs. It, it, yeah, man. We that's all met there. And that's why I honed my, if you want to call it my skills, you know, you played against your brothers a lot. But you wanted to show out against your friends, too. No doubt. Oh, you have to. So, you have to. Very, very instrumental in my life right now uh, as an ambassador like Shaq and, and Jennifer Lopez. They're very uh, – Denzel, they're very involved in the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. And it's been my foundation. Um, I have a reading program through the Boys and Girls Clubs of America where 
We impact about 5,000 kids a day. It's really important to read kids if you're listening, uh, especially at this time where everybody's in their house. Yep. So, you know, the video games, that's all good and well, but there's nothing wrong with a great book and learning from the book because that builds knowledge and knowledge is power. And, I, and I'll tell you because um, we're, as parents, we're all now uh, becoming teachers at home. I mean, yeah, we, have, oh, we, we got teachers, to. Right? We have so I'm to. now we have teaching to. my kids. I mean, we're, we're, we speak French as, as, as at home, so we're reading French books and English. It's a, it's a tough gig, man. You give respect to the teachers out there and uh, the guys that are out there in the community at Boys and Girls yeah. Clubs that are impacting these kids these days. Amazing. Exactly. It is. Uh, and, and I remember a lot of the counselors, and that's what they were. Now, they weren't just babysitters. You know, maybe back then it was different because it wasn't, the technology wasn't as, uh, obviously isn't as great as, as it is now with computers and all stuff going on. But when you didn't have no cell phone and no way of communicating other than that long phone at the home with the long cord, uh, you know, you had one phone that sat on the wall. That's it. And that was a house phone. That's it, man. And that phone had a cord that went in every room in your house. <laughs> and it stretched. It, it has some elasticity to it for a while, I'm, but the longer you kept stretching that phone cord, the shorter it got. I'm gonna tell you something because there's a lot of guys that are, there's a lot of people that are listening to us right now that don't that know nothing about it. I'm fortunate enough that I mean I grew up in the '80s a little bit, early '90s, and I remember the the phone. We didn't have the cell phones. We had the phones. So you yeah, had to man. wrap that thing around, yeah. or you had to post up at the wall in the kitchen and, and just chat it up. Yeah, and then your brothers would be standing there going, "Can I get a turn? Can I get yeah. a phone?" And you'd be like, mm -hmm, "No." But you know what it is, man. It's funny because it seems like all those things come back and you think about it, and it has something to do with life right now, especially what's going on with this coronavirus. All the things that you kind of just forgot to do, something as bad as this virus and what's going on in this world is really bringing back those things that you got to really get in touch with again. It's a and, pause for and, cause. Yeah, and and my daughter's in Spain right now. She's she's on she's on quarantine in Spain. I heard. Um, and she, uh, I talk, I Facetime with her almost every other day to make sure she's okay. And uh, it's uh, it's no joke, man. It's she's, no joke. She, she's still daddy's girl, so that's that you have to make oh, no, sure. No doubt about it, man. No I got about it. I got three girls, man, so I know. Yeah, so and I know. and I was actually planning on going over there in the next couple months, but obviously that's on hold. Yeah, for um, sure. But it um it really brings you back and, and just tells you it tells you how important things are. And we gotta realize how because sometimes th the the most important things we just, you know, eh, take for granted. Whatever, we take for granted. And we gotta realize how important it is. I mean, these healthcare workers and these people on the front lines are not only risking their lives, but they're helping us be safe. So we have to do our part, and everybody's been hearing that on TV, uh, through all the news media and everything. Do your part so we not only we can stop this and its tracks, but we can help those people on the front lines do their job. I like it, man. So, listen, ladies and gentlemen, we are tuned in with Hall of Famer. It has a great ring, by the way. I know you've been hearing it for years now. Or you before that, you were hearing future Hall of Famer. But the yeah. Hall of Famer, Andre Reid, is with us right now. It's the Buffalo Fanatics, my guy, Reid. I got I'm my shirt on today. To I'm, I'm representing today, so, you know. I see you. And I see that I little thing represent. behind you. I see that bus behind you. I see Yeah, you. man. Hey, I talk, hey I, I'm not going to lie to you. I talk to him every now and again. Hey, look, sometimes you got to. Sometimes I got to talk to him, man. man. I got to talk so, to him. And guess what? I'm, yes, the older sir. You get, the older you get, he starts answering. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you, met, you mentioned something earlier. You said relationships. Um, yeah. It's important to keep the relationships. So, how have you been keeping the relationships with your former yeah. players and even the young players that are now calling you and and saying, "Hey, um, exactly, I That's need a great advice question. on that." What what do you how, how do you how do you uh, how do you translate? How do you give us insight on that? Well, that's a great question. I think, uh, and as as I I played in the league for a long time, and those those guys and that organization, that whole city became a part of me because I kind of ident not only did I identify with them on the field, but I identified with the city of Buffalo, and. One thing about Buffalo is though they don't change. They're the same people. They're the same fans. And we talk about Bills Mafia. Shout out to Bills Mafia out there. Yes, sir. Uh, that they are so passionate about their team, passionate about their city. They want a winner. And it's evident, and you talk to anybody from that city, that they will stick with their team through thick and thin. It doesn't matter. And that's why they are so different. Those fans are so different than any other fans of sports. And you could talk about Green Bay and the Pittsburgh fans and the Dallas. 
Nothing like some Buffalo fans. I, Nothing like I'm, them. I'm telling you, man. I, I'm from Canada, right? So I don't I don't live there, but I've been rooting for the Bills for for so long. And we're at, we're at I get Canada. Ch- we're I'm in Canada. I'm in Ottawa. I'm in Ottawa on the slash border of Gatineau and Quebec, Gatineau, Quebec, and Ottawa. So I'm right there. I'm in the capital. Or the, as they say, when I first heard Ottawa, I thought it was Ottawa. Ottawa. You know what? Well, let, me, let me keep you on game. So we've got a, we've got a, a big Native community uh, in, in 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 Ottawa, and mm-hmm. Ottawa was the way that they pronounce it as well. Uh, so really, kind of okay. kind of close, kind of close. Um, yeah. So here here's a question because I've always wanted to ask this question to you. I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit, but nothing crazy. Okay, so it it pains me to remind, but you've been going through it for years, so you know. So the '90s bills were were something to 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 reckon with. We just had uh, misfortunes when it went when we went to the Super Bowl. So a, a fun question: If you could choose any player on the current Bills squad right now that you could bring back to the '90s team when you guys were in that Super Bowl era, who would you bring that would bring you guys over the hump? Wow, that's a that's a great question, uh, and and this is no disrespect to any of the guys. No doubt, uh, right now, um, that that is a uh, man. I might have to think about that one a little bit. It, it's uh, it, it's okay. It's a tough one because I was actually thinking about it today because I'm like, man, that team was so epic. I wonder if they were just a piece or two away. But you know what? How do I make it current enough on this team? Who would you bring over? Defense, yeah. offense, maybe even some coaching. Maybe McDermott comes over. I don't know. What do you What are your thoughts? Um, you know, over the years, um, I, I just, and I say this all the time that people in the media want to talk to me about the Bills team, uh, the last four years since Sean McDermott became head coach and since Brandon Bean was, you know, now is the GM, uh, I, I think it all starts, uh, to a certain point with the quarterback and there's, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, in this league, you're going to go as far as your quarterback goes 90, at least 80, 90% of the time. Okay. And. The Bills right now with their quarterback, uh, Josh, Josh Allen, and, and I've gotten to know him as a person over the last three, four years. Yeah. Um, and, and it's funny. I talk about the draft every year. And when Josh got drafted, I was at, I was in a, at the Super Bowl, and they brought uh, a lot of the draftees that were going to be probably the top 20 guys drafted, offensive guys. Okay. And Josh Allen was one of them in this room. It was me. Um, the newest Hall of Famer, Steve Atwater, Jim Brown was there, Rod Woodson. I mean, you had Hall of Famers in his room with these young kids that are big just, dogs. their eyes are just like this big, you know? And Josh Allen was the first kid I talked to. Amazing. He was the first, first guy I talked to. And I talked to Saquon Barkley, and I talked to some of those guys coming out that year. But I really developed a rapport with Josh Allen, not only because he was a quarterback, but just his mentality. And he already had that blue collar mentality when I spoke to him. And I said, I said, yo, man, I said, I'd love to have you in Buffalo, man. You're a perfect fit for Buffalo. And then I wrote, I said something about. Do you know something that we don't know? And I'm like, nah, I just was talking to Josh Allen and everybody was, you know, commenting on it. We drafted him. You and see, uh, so you spoke it into existence. See, man, I got a little, hey, I got something up here yet. I got a lot knocked around, but I got something up here. I, just I hear you, man. Um, but, so, and the thing is, and, he, and I, want, I don't want to take away from that. Um, when you talk about the Josh Allens and the team that we currently have right now, mm-hmm. uh, does it remind you of anything that was being built back then when you look at the team, or mm-hmm. is it completely different? Um, it's, that's such a vague question. I mean, I, I can't really compare our team or even the okay. players to a certain point. Uh, okay. to to the to the current team right now, um, it was a different time. Um, I mean, there were seven Hall of Famers on that team. I, mean, I know, it, man. It's, 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 that's a tough one. That is a tough. It's one. it's it's a coach and an owner and a GM. Uh, so for me to, I'd be doing an injustice to these guys right okay. now for me to compare to that. But I do see some similarities in just the way the culture has changed. Okay. Uh, and that's really as a as a team that's trying to find something to get over that hump. Yeah. Sean McDermott, when we had that meeting, was me, Bruce Thurman, all the usual characters. Yeah. You want to call it because that's what we were. Of course. We were characters. But he invited us. I think it was maybe about a month or two after he got the head coaching job, 
And I got a call from the front office there in Buffalo, and, uh, and they said, uh, hey, what are you doing? It was about this time of the year. Okay. And um, Sean McDermott would love to have you come to Buffalo and sit down uh, with some of the players, Jim, Thurman, Bruce, all of us, and just pick our brains on not only what that team was about, but how did you go in week in and week out about just winning? How did you figure out how to win? And how did that become contagious in that locker room? Mm -hmm. Win, lose, draw. How did that become contagious? And we sat down with, with him at Sear. I don't know if you ever been, you've ever been to Sear in Buffalo? Pretty, pretty Never nice been. place. Never been. Pretty, pretty nice restaurant. Actually, Fred okay. Jackson Fred Jackson and uh, Brian Mormon have steak in it. So if I'm you're in actually, Buffalo, go to Sear. Now but I'm going to have to go there. Go to Sear. Great food. Yes, sir. So we sat in this little office, you know, this little secluded room in the back. Nobody can bother us. We had, uh, you know, they closed all the doors, you know, it was soundproof, all that. It was like, it was like the Pentagon in there, you know, it was really. <laughs> and he just didn't say one word. He just said, thank you for being here. And he said his little intro. And then we just started talking like we were in the locker room. And, and people don't realize this, that we acted like we were in the locker room. We started busting on each other, this, this, this. And Sean McDermott was like this. Mm, he, he felt it. He felt it, and he goes, maybe, you know, maybe we should start busting on each other a little more or something. I mean, I like it sounds kind of stupid, but nah, he that, saw that. us really in a locker room. The brotherhood. And, we, and that's where it all started. And he didn't say one word. He just was jotting stuff down. Okay, so yeah. you hear about Phil Jackson uh, when he was coaching the, when he was coaching, um, the Bulls. He didn't. He did. He made them read. He made them do things that are stimulating their minds and so on and so forth. And you right. hear all these coaches that try to bring teams together, like McDermott. What he's doing. He's got offensive defense sitting together. He's got team outings. What did Marv Levy do to make you guys so tight? Back I, then, I, I don't even think it, it wasn't Marv. I think he might have had a say, but Marv was a very quiet guy. Okay. You know, he always used to say this: "Hey, walk softly, but carry a big stick." Mm, somewhere, like some, that. something down the line somewhere down the line you're going to have to use that stick don't say nothing though but just keep it behind you so nobody can see it and then bring That's it out fast. boom because I saw I saw the interview you did with Rich Eisen and Rich Eisen asked asked you a question about uh, who was who was yapping their gums and you couldn't really name anybody that was yapping their gums and you weren't one to yap your gums but you carried a big old stick on that damn field and that's, that's, that was me. I was this. I was the. Uh, yeah, I was that guy behind the door. That that's gonna get you. That's gonna get you. you I hear whether that. you think I it or that. not, it was like you'd be sitting there, and all of a sudden you'd be like, "Why am I bleeding?" And I'd be like, mm, "I did it. <laughs> Nobody saw me, but I got that was me. Quick. That's how smooth that cut was." Ah uh, man, I hear you. So but I I think Marv really didn't really take that on to to answer your question. He just let okay. the players. He let the players be players. And when it came to Sundays, I think Marv, he just really, to a certain point, let us go. And if he had to inter interject on something, obviously he's the head coach. We respected him. Um, he would do that. But I think he just let us be players, let us be people. And in the locker room, you hardly saw Marv in the locker room. When mm -hmm. he came in the locker room, he was moving. He was flying by. He really wouldn't talk to people, and that's nothing against Marv, but his intellect didn't let his intellect let him let the players be the players. I like that, man. So, so I guess yeah. there's a new I guess there's a new policy in town. It's the big stick policy. Yeah, man. That's that's it. I think Audrey it's always been says, like that. It's hey, always hey, been like that. Walk around it's, with that big it's, stick. It's that guy that you don't know that got that big club. I like you. He's the, he's the one that's going to settle the settle the score. Okay. Yeah. So settling the score, I like that. So I can kind of bring this into it. So you look at the offense that we have right now and and the weapons that we brought in, right? We brought in Cole Beasley and John Brown last year, significantly mm -hmm. brought the offense up. It obviously improved Josh Allen's game because statistically everything moved up. Mm -hmm. So you look at the, the addition of Stefan Diggs, and I know you probably spoke on this a zillion times. Now, I'm going to try to put a twist on this on this question, and not to not to stump you too much, but a guy that 
has diva-like qualities is what people are saying. Does that does that trigger our quarterback, do you think? Does that make a difference, or does a quarterback want something like that? Well, I think, uh, I mean, that's a double-edged sword there. You're gonna, you, know, you can get cut of both ends with that. Um, me, I wasn't, you know, I mean, I think I played in the best era of all when it came to receivers with Jerry and Tim, Chris Carter, uh, Tim Brown, well, Tim, Jerry, uh, Michael Irvin. I, I can yep. go on and on. Um, you're you're going to have guys like that because not only are they confident in, in their, their play, but maybe it's been a part of them their whole life. Yeah. And, and I think – as soon as this, you know, this coronavirus and all this stuff are, is over with and we can move a little bit more, I guarantee you when, when Stefan gets a chance to get up to Buffalo and, and get with Josh and get with the head coach, uh, I think they're going to see what he's like from the first 15 minutes they're with him. And I, I, I really think that Sean does not want to mess up that locker room. I don't think that's, so the most, that's really the most important thing is that locker room. Because yeah. if there's dissension in the locker room, then that then it tends to seep out the door and go upstairs. And before you know it, it's upstairs and it's back and forth. You, you don't want that. And no, they got a that. good thing. They, they got a good thing going on now. So, uh, and I don't think Stefan, everybody's got that in them to a certain point. You got to. Does he, does he, does he want to win? Of course. Yeah. Of course he wants to win. I had a chance to see him and didn't get, didn't get a chance to talk with him this year um, when the Chargers played the Vikings out here in San Diego. Right. And um, took some kids through my program down on the field. And Stefan was on the other other side of the field. But I got a chance to talk to Adam Thielen for a little bit. Okay. How was that? And, oh, man. Not only a great guy, great player, very personable, um, just a class act. And, and I okay. think Sean wants that, wants a class act guy that doesn't take a me first kind of attitude and is really all about the team. And when it's your time, it's your time to shine. That's when you shine. And um, I like that. And I think I think he's been like that ever since he was a head coach or he was a defensive coordinator in uh, yeah. Carolina. So does he bring? He he definitely brings a defensive mentality. Yep. Uh, too, because they picked up two guys from Carolina this year, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, 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 yeah. It's the, Carolina, it, it's the it's the Buffalo Panthers. You yeah. Know, it's, it's, it feels it's, like. It's Buffalo South again to a certain point. <laughs> it's Buffalo South. Um, yeah. So, so, so I think I think Sean has a hold on the on the locker room in that kind of manner, and like that's that. really what a head head coach is supposed to do. And and a couple stories about when 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 I played is if we won a game or lost a game, uh, we had our captains, if you want to call them captains, whether we won or lost, these guys were very vocal about what's coming up next. Okay, we would lose a game. Marv would come in, you know, during the meeting after the game the next day, and maybe Thurman, maybe Jim, maybe Bruce or whoever would say, hey, all the coaches out, we need to speak. Mm. We got to talk to the team. We got to talk about what's happening right now. Players only meeting. Players only meeting. Coach would leave. They yeah. all would leave. But guess what? When they left, the, they left that door, they left the, uh, the room, they were like, that's what we want. Absolutely. That's what Absolutely. we want. So I, like I, I think Sean has a hold of it, hold on of it in that manner. And uh, again, he doesn't want to lose the locker room. A coach does not want to lose the locker room. That's number Never. one. Yeah, uh, that's, that's facts. Um, yeah. Okay, so locker room. And I'm, I'm glad you brought, you brought this up because when you go back to, and I'm not going to go too far back, but this is a memorable season, the season of '99 to 2000, where the Bills had to make some very, very tough decisions. And they saw three of the stars have to leave based on budget. Right. You, Thurman, Bruce. Right? Got to go. How – what are you going through when you see, oh, snap, like we got – like we're break, they're breaking up the group. Yeah, how, man. How was it then? It, it was it's, – it, it's, it's hard to explain because it wasn't like I knew what was going to happen. But I was kind of – we all were kind of like – thinking the same thing. Mm. Uh, we knew that the franchise uh, was going in a different direction, which is okay because all yeah. franchises in every sport after a while have to, you know, have to hey, switch the gears yeah, get, and go in a different direction. Um, 
I mean, it happened, and you know, Bruce ended up going to Washington. He played another three years. Yeah, I actually uh, went to Denver. Uh, was in Denver in training camp because I didn't want to go out like that. Of course not. Uh, was there for preseason and uh, got released by Denver, and I never got released in anything. Never. And and that was a shock to me. But anyway, I understood that. And then Bruce talked to Daniel Snyder and talked to uh, the brass there in Washington. And I only wanted to play one more year anyway. I, I mean, it would have been yeah, so. I was just one year. Yeah, I knew it was time for me to switch gears myself and go in a different direction and, and kind of just go out as much as I can the way I wanted to, if, yeah. if that was the case. And, you know, it was time to change, change gears and I, and I get gears it. And, and start something new and new in life, because basically I was starting over new. you damn right. And I ended up getting in yeah, I ended up getting in Washington, played there for 13 games. And I knew it was time for me to leave the game that I played for for 30 years. Yeah, man, that's a long time. And, but it was time, and I was fine with that because some guys play three, four years, something happens, and they never. You're so blessed. I, I, yeah, so I was very, very satisfied. Not only to play in Buffalo, the greatest sports city, city of all time to me. Damn right. And play with these players that were Hall of Famers and just great people. Because great when coaches. I. When I look at the the Denver team that you went to, and I was looking, okay, so what was it on them on that Denver team that that the coach, I think it was Shanahan at the time, yeah, didn't feel like Andre Reed could contribute. He had McCaffrey, uh, Rod Smith, Rod, Terrell Davis was coming in to Terrell Davis was coming in, so that was a yeah. good squad to go to. How could he not find I, an I Andre think, Reed? I on think, yeah, that's a good question too. I think you know now guys that get on teams now that have played a long time, you know, I mean. Um, Veteran leadership, you can't go you can't go wrong with that. No doubt. And I, I think um, maybe there was a decision that he made that, you know, you're going to do what's best to a certain point for the franchise. Yeah. Um, and, and I was fine with it. Um, but you can't go wrong with veterans on a team that have been there before. You can't. You, you could put the game yeah. on them, man. Yeah. And, and Mike has been in Super Bowls and, and coached Super Bowls and all that kind of stuff. So – uh, again, I was fine with it. It wasn't like I played five years and, yeah. you know, had five or six more I wanted to play, and it just yeah. never panned out for some reason. So No, no doubt. I mean, you had you have 13 seasons of 50 catches or more. I don't want to hear nothing about, oh, he, he couldn't contribute on the Denver Broncos. Hey, bump all that. I ain't trying to hear that. I ain't yeah. trying to hear that. So what makes a player – I think this is a tough part for a player, and I, I, basketball, football, whatever you name it, when you have to come to the realization, like – I can't do this no more, or is it my body's not letting me do this no more? What is it that says I'm done? I think it's a combination of all that. Sometimes your body goes, yeah, and your mind goes, no. Mm. Sometimes your mind goes, yeah, I could do this, and your body says no. Or did I say that already? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so, saying it's the opposite. Yeah. Your body might want to do it, but your mind ain't, ain't, ain't feeling it. Yeah. Okay? But then again, your mind's like, yeah, 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 but your body says, you know what? I can't do it. Does your and pride take a hit? I think so, especially if you play played a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody that is put on a helmet has some sense of pride and some some, some sense of pride in themselves and what they can yeah. do, their abilities. And when that time comes, when you feel like you're fighting between your body and your mind, and that ability isn't just like boom there like it used to be, you're you're like at a crossroads, and and you start questioning yourself, and you don't want to start doing that. Because, I hear you. Yeah, you don't want to question yourself a lot of times because you. then it's like this guy on this shoulder and this guy on this shoulder telling you one thing, and they're fighting each other. But up here, this is where it's got to be. It's got to be up here. So. Right, up, right up in here. No, I, I, yeah. I hear yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Hall of Famer Andre Reed. Jordan, yo, you look sharp, man. What's going on? I'm a little gray, man, but, you know, check out this dude right here. This dude right here. <laughs> He ain't got no gray on him, man. He got no gray, but uh, <laughs> he ain't got no gray. I I'm, I'm blessed, that, man. man. I'm very blessed. Um, I'm blessed to do and and play as long as I have, and now inspire other kids. Um, you know, recently in the last four or five years, I've been talking to a lot of the draft picks coming in, especially receivers. Um, I don't know if you saw on uh, the Hall of Fame website they had a uh, uh, a little thing going on where they put a Hall of Famer with 
one of the players coming out in the draft this year. Okay. Um, at the Super Bowl this year down in Atlanta. Yes, yeah, speak uh, on that. And uh, I got a chance to talk to Jerry Judy, who's probably going to be top 10 pick this year. Himself. And basically it was just him asking me questions about, you know, what it was like in the league. What did you expect from yourself? How does the team – just a lot of his questions. Of course. Um, on how do you stay in the league? What did you do uh, when you felt uh, – um, you know, when did you feel like it was time for you to go? Um, who are your favorite teammates? You know, all those kind of questions. And, and you know, Derek Brooks did it with uh, a linebacker. Um, Daryl Green did it with a defensive back. So it was real good. That's really cool. It was a real great interaction um, That's awesome. with, these, with these guys coming in. And I tell them, you got to be yourself, number one. It doesn't matter what kind of ability you have how many catches you have, what you did in college. You got to be the guy that you were in college. And then again, at the drop of a dime, you got to switch. You got to. You got to switch up quick because you're going to be asked to do a lot. People are going to be watching you every time. And I told him, I said, wherever you go, when you get drafted, there's eyes on you. Yes. Oh, not just, yes. two, not just two pair of eyes, but there's be 50 pair of eyes watching you. So how do you deal with that? And I said, what your ability can do on the field, that's how you, that's what you can control. You can control yes. that. You can't control anything else outside of that. So just control that. Do what you can do what you know how to do. And all the rest of it should take, you know, you know, take it, it should take its own mind. That, that's real talk from OG, man. And I said, I said to him, too, the last thing I said to him, I said, remember, do the work when nobody's wa watching. Mm, that's, that's important. When nobody's watching, you do the work. 